There's a lot going on in the world around us, and a lot of people are wondering about the end times, the rapture, the return of Christ, and thank you for joining me. I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor. This is the Nazarene Stream Preacher. We're going to be talking about the rapture, and the understanding that I have it now that we're past 2020, going through 2021 and the future, just seeing with the clarity that God has given me over the last few years, I want to talk about this whole idea of what it looks like for Christ to return and really a lot of pieces that we have together from the New Testament. So thank you for joining me. I know I haven't done a lot lately. I've been working on a book, a novel, and it's called Midheaven, the fragment of the fallen word. And you can actually check out that novel on CastBox. The first three quarters of it are released. I'm releasing it in quarters and the final quarter of that book will be out soon. And there's just been a lot of stuff going on with church and everything like that. But let's talk about the rapture. I know a lot of times we get on these topics of end times and it turns into kooky stuff really quickly, but one of the things which I have found to be really phenomenal is God has graced me with a lot of certainty this last year. You know, a lot of people want the world to go back to the way it was, say, 2019 or earlier. I am not of that school of thought. I like the clarity of seeing people really stand where they really are going to stand. I like the clarity of seeing where the idols are. I like the shibboleths, the facades being down where you can really see where the, the evil is. I like things being out in the open. And when it comes to scripture and understanding the end times, the book of Revelation is no longer a dark mystery as it kind of had been to most of my life, including most of my pastoral ministry. I mean, I'm a young man, I'm almost 30. And when it comes to the issue of the rapture, a concept which is not found in the book of Revelation, but rather in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I also have a lot more uh, understanding on that too, a lot more clarity. And the understanding I have is largely based in the concept of a calamity. Hence, we're playing The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild, where the great calamity has destroyed Hyrule. So let's go now to... 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and read verse 13 and start our understanding of the rapture. So going to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 it reads, but we do not want you to be uninformed. Again, the scripture itself is trying to tell us we need to be informed about things. We do not want you to be uninformed brothers and sisters about those who have died so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. All right, so we read verses 13 and 14, and this scripture, the whole context around the rapture is around hope. And it's really important to understand, in the ancient world, they didn't have a lot of the fa facades of luxury that we do in our modern day and age. There weren't a lot of phony things that could give people escape from the world around them. You know, right now, I've been out doing pastoral stuff all day. I can come home, tend to stuff at home, and then turn on The Legend of Zelda for a few minutes. They didn't have that luxury in the ancient world. But instead, what they got was people being killed for their faith, tyrants coming through town, you know, slaying entire generations, enslaving entire people, uh, wiping entire groups of people out to never be seen or heard from again. You know, life is brutal in the fall. This last year, I've been reminded of something that a lot of us had forgotten. And even in my own life, I had forgotten the weight of it. God alone makes the good and we are fallen creatures. We can tell that there's a lot of division going on in our world right now. Sometimes people think it's politically left and right. Sometimes people think it's the elites versus the commoners. I think one of the most fundamental separations between the groups in our society are those who remember they are fallen creatures and those who have forgotten they are fallen creatures. And even for us in the church who recognize and will say that God alone makes the good and we recognize that there's a fall, sometimes we have forgotten the weight of what that really means. And when it comes to understanding the rapture and comes to understanding the scripture that teaches of the rapture, it comes to a world where there really feels like there's no hope, where everything feels dark and it feels really bleak. 
And people are seeing heinous things. They're seeing their friends murdered. They're seeing their family murdered. They're seeing people bow down to all sorts of wicked and really, really dumb stuff. And Paul is writing these words and he's giving encouragement saying, what I'm about to tell you is about hope. Take hope in it. Take hope in contrast to the calamity. So what we need to do, if I can get a bow out, going to the next verse in verse 16, it says, for the Lord himself will cry of command with the archangel's call and with the sound of a trumpet. He will descend from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Okay, so those verses I just read there, uh, 16 through 18, is really where we find the language of the rapture. And what we find here is that there will be people who are raised from the dead. They will join with the Lord. Now, what is fascinating about this is the dead in Christ will rise first, and then there will be those who are alive being brought up. In the past, through a lot of the Christian art and stuff, I've always envisioned the rapture being something like, you know, you're on an airplane and suddenly the people next to you went away. You're at home mowing your lawn and your neighbors who are right with God, they disappear and it's like out of the blue and nobody expected it coming. Scripture tells us that no one knows the hour. No one knows the exact moment when the day of the Lord will occur. However, I don't think it's so out of the blue where you're just sitting on your couch at home and suddenly like you're surprised that it happened. I want us to think about childbirth for a moment. You know, if someone is about to be born, you know, their mother and father, they have a date that they're expecting. And the mother, she has this child inside her. She knows it's coming. And as that day and hour gets closer. You know, a lot of things happen to, to, to a woman's body as she's getting ready to, to give childbirth. There are birth pangs. There are a lot of signs where things get closer and closer. And even if someone's birthday is projected to be something like June 5th, if June 1st comes along and the mother recognizes the contractions, they're, they're to a certain point, you know, the hour has come. If she calls her, her husband and says, hey, you know, I've got to go to the hospital right now. You know, if that happened on June 1st, you wouldn't be that surprised. You know, it was expected on June 5th, but June 1st came and that hour said it was the time and, you know, it happened. You did not know the exact hour or day that that happened, but you, you had a general estimation. You know, another example I might give is I live in Tennessee. Tennessee weather is crazy. You might have a day that feels like summer set next to a day that feels like winter. Like it's it's crazy in Tennessee. It could be 90 degrees outside. It could be 40. Well, you know, if you have a week in Tennessee where all the weather is like 67 degrees, 67 degrees, the next day is like 72 degrees and you wake up and there's frost outside because it was 30 degrees, you know, that, that might be a little bit of a surprise but not really, because you know you live in Tennessee. Like, there's, there's a certain amount of expectation that the environment was ready for it. And, to that point, if you have a few days where it's really warm and then a few days where it's really cold, you know, a lot of times that's because there are all these weather fronts mixing which produce powerful and terrible storms. So if you get word that there are tornadoes coming after it was really hot outside one day and then really cold, it's not surprising. You didn't know the day or the hour that a tornado came, but when you live in Tennessee and it's the right time of year, or many other states, or many other places around the world where there is regular weather phenomenon that happens, you may not always know the day or hour, but you get an impression of things based on what time of year it is, what's going on outside. You know, if there's a big weather pressure drop, big storm is coming. Well, when we look out across scripture, we look out across the great purview which God has revealed to us. When Moses was called to lead the people out of slavery, it didn't happen out of random, you know, you were just on an airplane one day and the next thing, 
a bush is talking to Moses. No, the people were enslaved. They were witnessing heinous evil, heinous injustice, and God had promised them deliverance. He had promised Abraham that his family, his children, they would be as numerous as the stars, the sands there in the desert, and they would have a great nation. It was known that God was going to give them deliverance from the calamity of the fall. For Abraham and Sarah, it was the simple calamity of not having children, not having a home, not really having any legacy or anything much to leave behind. They knew they would be delivered from that, but they didn't know exactly the day or hour. But yet, when things got very severe, God called Moses. He drew him up out of the water. Just as his mother had lowered him into the water and Pharaoh's daughter had drawn him up, God drew Moses up out of that situation. We look at the fall into Babylon, you know, another massive crisis moment. It didn't happen out of random, you know, turning of events. Israel was not all healthy and everybody was faithful before God. And suddenly, you know, everybody was out tending to their lawns one day. And the next thing you know, you're all being hauled away to be, you know, the, the least of subjects in a foreign nation. It didn't happen like that. No, there were... Years, decades, generations of decline, unfaithfulness galore. There were prophets saying, hey, this is going to happen if you don't repent. And the people did not really repent like they should. By the time King Josiah comes along to have his reforms, it's really too late. And when Jesus even comes, you have these Maccabean revolts. You have Herod and the whole Herodian dynasty underway who are kind of nominally claiming to be Jewish, but they do a lot of wicked things. They aren't really loving rulers. The Herod, Herodian dynasty are, the Herods aren't. They're, they're kind of wicked. You see Rome doing heinous things to the Jewish people. You see wicked laws and things like that. And when Jesus is born of Mary, the world was expecting a Messiah. They were anticipating it. They didn't know the hour when it would come, but they were anticipating it. And the reason why I bring all of this up is when we look at the idea of the rapture, which is found here in Thessalonians 4, and we look at this scripture, we find that there are really two things that we know. Well, I might say that we know that this, this hour is going to happen. There will be this, this cry of command that comes out. From, from heaven, the archangel's call will be there with the sound of God's trumpet. The Lord himself will descend from heaven. We, we know this moment's happening, and then from that, the dead in Christ will rise, and then those who are alive. Now, what we don't know is how long those who have been dead will have been dead. And this is where my perspective on the rapture has changed. We have deluded ourselves with modern luxury, really for the last few generations. And I've got a dog barking in another room. I don't know if anyone can hear that. But I think it will emerge out of a calamitous situation. When we look at Revelation itself, and this is where I've come to this conclusion, you find the beast emerging in Revelation 13. The whole world worships it. The question of the beast is not whether or not the beast is real. The question is, what do you do in response to the beach, beast? When we look at the, the rest of Revelation, we can look in Revelation 15 and we see that there are those who had died, been killed by the beast. They are given life in heaven again and or in God's kingdom, which God's kingdom is actually bigger than heaven. That's another thing the New Testament teaches us. We find that in Revelation 15, and I'll just read this verse here, it says, And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had conquered the beast and its image, and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their head. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Now here they have life, but they did not get to this moment peacefully. 
they got to this moment as a result of great evil. When you look at Revelation 20, verse 4, you find that Jesus raises from the dead people who had beheaded, who had been beheaded by the beast, and they are now given the authority to reign with Christ for a thousand years. And Revelation 20, verse 4 says, Then I saw thrones, and those seated on them were given authority to judge. And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now again in this moment, they did not come back to life out of the blue. There was a beast that appeared out of the sea, and heinous things happened. People worshipped the beast. People did shameful things. They fell to the indignity of idolatry that was so severe that none repented, none recovered from it. When the beast emerges, those who are not saved on the front end, there, there is no recovery or repair, no repentance. It's not because God decided to reject people. It's because people decided to so absolutely reject God. Well, when this goes back to Thessalonians, I believe the rapture will not just happen with you out mowing the lawn. I think people are going to know it's coming. You may not know the day or the hour, but I think it's going to be in a, a dark period. And the people who died that are raised to, the, to life first, they may have only died five minutes earlier after being beheaded. Some of them may have been dead all the way back to the early church. Again, it's going to be a singular moment where many are raised. But... I think it's going to be more calamitous and more known to be a calamitous moment than we have potentially felt in the church. I don't think it's going to be like we go outside and be like, oh no, I don't think I repented enough. My my neighbor is gone and so is everybody else on the street. I, I think it's going to be more like there is heinous evil, heinous untruth around the world that is so obvious. You know, the, the beast has arrived. The The global evils have arrived. And just as I wrap this conversation up, one thing I do want us to keep in mind is we actually do live in an era now where it is possible to have global evils, global deceptions, to have a singular character, something like the beast, emerge and have all people worship it in like the matter of a day. But that's actually possible now. You know, in Jesus' time, it had not been possible for people to minister around the world in the way that the early church spread, but the the infrastructure of Rome permitted for the gospel to spread. It was actually a really ideal time for the Messiah to come. Well, we now live in a in a time where global phenomenons, you know, global rulers all going together to meet a, a harlot in the wilderness, all of these things are actually possible. Not just metaphorically, not just symbolically, but literally possible now. Telling people they can't buy or sell or trade without a mark. It, it's possible now. And we're starting to see things reflect that. So my final thought on Revelation is actually me wising up and recognizing that God alone makes the good. And I'm going to reject some of the things that I had been taught um, when I went to, to school. The whole notion that Revelation is never to be taken. Literally, it has no serious meaning. It is just the Apostle John trying to poetically describe ancient Rome. I don't think that's the case. I think ancient Rome was reflecting Revelation. I think ancient Rome was reflecting the cosmic battles of good and evil. Just like in our modern day and age, there's a lot of things reflecting those battles, but the signs, the birth pangs, the potential for global calamity, where there are global deceptions that now exist in the information age, you know, the information superhighway, the internet, is a lot like the ancient roads of Rome, the ancient roads of Rome were used to spread the gospel. The internet, it is ripe to spread evil. So that's my thoughts for everyone. I hope we enjoyed this. Again, thank you for joining me. I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor. This is the Nazarene Stream Preacher. And thank you for joining me. Check out the audiobook. It's on CastBox called Midheaven. It's about gargoyles and demons and spiritual warfare. And it's coming to a really, really wonderful close. So thank you for joining me. God love you and have a blessed day.